Here we have the Earth. We are, this is the North Pole. So we are uh, viewing the Earth from above the North Pole. And it's spinning around this rotational axis once every 24 hours. On the other hand, it takes moon about a month. In fact, the word uh, month comes from the moon because uh, ancients have noticed, uh, the most uh, ancient civilizations have noticed the regularity in different phases of the moon. It takes about one month for a phase to repeat itself, say from one full moon to another. It takes about 29 and a half, roughly 30 days, okay? So it's not surprising that uh, people uh, have used uh, the lunar cycles, the cycle of lunar phases, as a calendar to measure the shorter intervals of time. So many calendars are uh, based on this so-called lunar cal calendars. Um, in fact, uh, 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 Jewish calendar uh, uh, is based on, on the lunar calendar even uh, today. Uh, so it takes one month for the moon to complete one full revolution around uh, the Earth. When you read this diagram, keep these two rates, different rates in mind. It takes Earth 24 hours to spin around once. It takes Moon one month, 30 times longer, to uh, make one complete revolution. OK, so there are several important positions uh, denoted here on this diagram for an observer on the Earth. For an observer that is positioned here, the sun is directly overhead. And we call that noon. When the sun is at the highest point above us, when it crosses so-called local meridian, uh, that's what we call noon. Okay? So an observer located here has sun directly overhead. and uh, he, this location corresponds to the noon. One on the opposite side, observer located here, there is the entire Earth between him and the sun. So for this observer, opposite to the one uh, uh, for whom it is noon, it's midnight. For this observer here, as the Earth is revolving around the north-south axis, the sun is about to dip below its horizon, or his horizon. This is the horizon of the observer located at this particular point labeled as sunset. So as he keeps on moving, Together with the Earth, his horizon is going to do like this. And the sun will be below the horizon. That's why this position here corresponds to the sunset. For this observer, the sun is about to set, fall below his horizon as he moves together with the Earth. On the opposite side of the Earth, this observer here sees sunrise because the sun is just about to appear above his horizon. Before the sun, uh, uh, sunrise, this would be uh, the horizon of the observer. Here's the observer before the sunrise, right? And then as he rotates together with Earth, at this point, the sun appears above his horizon. And therefore, uh, he sees sunrise. So these four characteristic locations correspond to different times of 
the day and night. Uh, noon, sunset, midnight, sunrise. The interval of time between sunrise and noon is often referred to as morning. The interval of time between noon and sunset is uh, referred to as afternoon. And generally, everything between sunset and sunrise, because the sun is not directly observable, it corresponds to night. But we still distinguish between the interval of time between sunset and midnight. We call that usually evening, early evening, late evening, right? And technically, this part here between midnight and sunrise is uh, night, but although sometimes, you know, you can be here at 1 o'clock in the morning and we still say 1 a.m. But so the important intervals are from sunrise to noon morning, from noon to sunset afternoon, and uh, here this entire area corresponds between sunset and sunrise to hours of darkness. Now, as it revolves around the Earth, the moon can be at these different positions here. When it's located here, we actually cannot see it. Why? Because unless it happens to be aligned with the sun, which it seldom is, we'll talk about the eclipses later. Remember that its orbit is tipped at an angle of five degrees. So it's likely either above or below the ecliptic. And the amount of light that we receive from the sun is so great that because of uh, its intensity, we cannot see anything else. We can't see star, we can't see moon, okay? So when the moon is located uh, in this region between the sun and the earth, it's called new moon. And we really cannot see the new moon. As it continues moving, revolving around the Earth, we start seeing more and more of its surface. So for instance, when it is at this location here, what we can see is this slice. This is the slice of its illuminated surface that we can see. And it's called, that phase is called waxing crescent. Let me just show you the actual photograph of so when the moon is in this waxing crescent phase this is what we see it's crescent but it's waxing because the amount of illuminated surface that we see is greater and greater over time Then, when the moon reaches this position here, labeled as B, we can see exactly a half of its surface illuminated. And that corresponds to what we call the first quarter moon. And this is what we see when we observe the first quarter moon. As the cycle progresses, we see more and more, more than a half. And that phase corresponds to a waxing gibbous. Gibbous uh, is uh, for, uh, I believe, comes from the Latin word for hunchback. And here's why. Yeah, it looks like a lump on the hunchback. That's why it's called waxing. Waxing because 
the amount of uh, illuminating surface uh, is growing, both for crescent and for the gibbous phase. And then when uh, the moon is located here, assuming, of course, that the Earth is not casting its shadow on it, and most of the time it's not, because the moon is either above or below uh, the ecliptic, the Earth's orbital plane, we'll see the entire half of the moon uh, illuminated. The entire face is illuminated, and that is what we call the full moon. Okay? And this is the photograph of the full moon. As the cycle proceeds, we start seeing less and less of fully illuminated surface, right? So now we have a veining gibbous. Again, hunchback, but it's getting smaller and smaller. And then at this location here, which is opposite to the first quarter location, we have the third quarter, but it's now the other side. So here, what we see looks like this, right? It looks like a letter D, the first quarter. But what will this, so the, the observer here sees a uh, right part as illuminated. But observer here would see from his vantage point, it would be his left part of the moon that is illuminated. So the third quarter looks like this, it looks like C. Okay, and after the third quarter, we see less and less. This is the segment that we can see from Earth illuminated. So now it's again a crescent phase. So while here the crescent phase looked like this, here we'll see the opposite crescent. Veining crescent looks like that. Veining because as the time goes on, as the moon proceeds towards the a new moon, that particular location, we see less and less of its illuminated surface. So this is a typical look of a waning uh, crescent. So you have to know by shape uh, how different phases look, right? To distinguish, say, between crescent phases and the gibbous phases, and to distinguish between waxing crescent and waning crescent, and waxing gibbous and waning gibbous, and also between first and third quarter. And the full moon is easy, and the new moon, there is no photograph because we can't see the new moon. Again, the interval between first and the third quarter is then two weeks, right? The interval of time between full and the third quarter is a week, and the interval of time between third quarter and the new moon is about a week. You check it for yourself. Start paying attention to the uh, moon and try to measure how long it takes safe uh, for it to get uh, from first quarter to full. Now, of course, it is not easy to say precisely whether it's a first quarter moon because you can't really tell just looking by the naked eye whether it's exactly a half of the disk that you see. But approximately, you can say this is near the first quarter, right? Same near the full moon, same near the third quarter. 